Hello, welcome. Today we are going over our second DC circuits, but we are doing a practicum. So basically all the concepts that we learned in the conceptual video talking about nodes, voltage, current, all that sort of stuff, and also in parallel and series resistance, we're going to do a little bit here and go over that. So first, we're going to go over a series circuit, talk a little bit about that, do some measurements, find the equivalent series resistance, and then we're going to move to our parallel circuit. We're going to do very similar things, and then we'll wrap it up and we'll be good to go. So let's start this out with me showing you exactly how both of these circuits are set up currently, so you can understand what I'm doing when I'm using the Discovery 3 from Digilent as well as I'm using their waveforms here, just so you can see where it's all connected. So let's do that really quick. So this is the series circuit that we have, where we have three resistors put in series. If you're not familiar with how breadboards work, I highly recommend that you go check out our breadboard video uh, lesson. But basically, just remember that these five holes are all electrically connected. So this row, this row, this row, and then also these five are connected on that side. So in this case, you can see that these two resistors right here are sharing an electrical node because they're together. But we have the power coming in. The voltage is going to drop over these three resistors before going to ground coming out there. So that's what we did with the series resistance. And then for the parallel, it looks a little bit more complicated, but it's not too, too bad. The biggest difference here is that we have our power coming in, but we also have the power going over to the other board. We have the ground coming in and then the ground going over to the other board, but we also have a reference ground. So this is basically something that when we are doing measurements, we have a power ground, making sure that this is at zero volts. But then when we measure it, we want to be measuring from that same reference. So we have to have a reference ground here that makes sure that we have the same. Well, I've said reference multiple times, and there's a reason. We have that same reference. So we all start at what we call zero volts. So that's why we have three things connected down here that are all basically acting as ground. But then we also have these little jumpers these little orange jumpers connecting these three resistors so that we get all of them connected together so that these are all connected to one node and these are all connected to one node. I hope that you can see that. So again, just remember that these three points right here are all in one node and then these three points are all in one node. And that's why these three resistors are in parallel. So I, I actually like this in particular because oftentimes when you're looking at a circuit, it may be one node, even though it goes here and connects over there and connects over there, but you realize, oh, there's nothing in the way that's still one node. And it's kind of the same way looking at this. Even though we have different holes and a whole bunch of stuff going on, electrically, all of these things are the same because they're all connected together. And the same thing down here, electrically, uh, these three are at the same voltage level because they're all connected together. Okay, so to get started, let's uh, go and turn on my screen capture software and open up waveforms. I've already actually I've already got it set up to act as a supply, so it'll be providing a one volt supply, and then we will also be using the analog in from right here to do our DC measurements. I do have again my inexpensive fifteen to twenty dollar, ten plus year old multimeter that we're going to be using for. Uh, resistance measurements later, but we don't need to use it as a voltmeter at this moment. So let's go and jump on to here. So this is a voltmeter. Let's go over to our supplies. As I mentioned, we're at one volt and I have the positive supply enabled, but I do not have the negative supply enabled and we do not have the master enable. So let's turn on the master enable. It's on, it takes a moment. And then we also want to make sure that our USB current down here doesn't spike to anything unreasonable. Again, we're not expecting a whole lot of power dissipation in these. So if you have a huge spike in your current, that means that something might be short circuited somewhat on there. Obviously, it's if it's completely short circuited, it'll throw up an error and it'll turn everything off because that would be a problem. But it looks like everything's good to go here. So let's go over to our voltmeter and we can turn that on to, there we go, we've got run. We can change our update speed right now. It's one second. We're just doing simple DC measurements right now, so it's not a big deal. Uh, so we are just floating there at about 18 millivolts. So let's, let's start by looking at our series resistors. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, this is our incoming voltage. And so we can just come here and check as we touch that. 
we are at 1.02 volts, exactly what, would you, what we'd expect. We're about 20 millivolts off of our nominal one volt output, very much within normal means. So that's exactly what we expect. Now, we don't actually know what these three resistor values are. And when I say we, I mean, I don't either. I just grab these and put them in. I remember they were fairly similar to each other, but I don't remember the exact values. I remember they were, again, fairly close. So we're going to see how much our voltage drops as it goes over this first resistive leg. And we're at about 759 millivolts. So 0.759 volts. So we've dropped about uh, a quarter of a volt over this resistor. And now let's look at the next resistor and see how much we have at this point. 400 and uh, about 19, 420, 419 millivolts. So we can tell just right now that we dropped about 250 millivolts there. Oh, a little bit more than 200 millivolts there. And we are going to drop about 400 because this one has ground on this side. So we're going to have about 420 millivolts dropped over this. So definitely we can tell just intuitively that this resistor is the biggest resistor. And we're going to do some measurements to find that out. So now I want to find out what these resistances are individually, find out what they are all together, and then put it into our calculator and see if it all makes sense and if it all matches. So I'm going to turn off the power and then I'm going to disconnect this because sometimes your tester can, or excuse me, not your tester in this case, but your power supply can actually affect the circuit. Your tester can also affect the circuit, but it's usually designed not to do so. But the power supply can change your impedance uh, unexpectedly. So I'm just going to unplug this power supply, and then we're going to do these measurements on these resistors. So we've got our handy dandy multimeter. First, we need to turn it on, just push the button. Notice where it volts at the moment. So we want to measure ohms, which is represented by that horseshoe, also known as omega. We also want to verify that our two leads are in the correct spot. We've got our negative in our com, our common, basically our ground. And then we have this in the spot that is measuring, as you can see, hertz, voltage, and ohms. So we are in the correct spot. We are not trying to measure current, which is what we'd be plugged into if we were over there. So now with that, I'm going to use my third hand to hold this in place while I measure each individual resistor. I'm also going to switch my screen so that we can put our measurements into our handy dandy calculator, which doing series resistors is very simple. It's just addition, but this actually is just a good place to write it down anyway. So our first place that we're going to measure, wow, maybe I need a fourth hand. I'm, see if I can actually use chopsticks. Fortunately, I was stationed in Japan, so I can kind of do chopsticks. Maybe it, it comes in handy sometimes. Okay, so I'm going to use this to measure across that resistor and we wait for it to settle and it comes out to 38.6 kilo ohms. So let me go over, type that in really quick, 38.6 and make sure I change my units here. I have been known to forget to do important things like that, and then I get really weird answers, which is why it's very important to say, hmm, that doesn't make sense, where did I mess up? So now let's go measure the second resistor. And that is 56.0 ohms. Type that in. And then the last resistor which again, we're expecting this last resistor to be the biggest. Actually, 56, yeah, 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 that makes sense. And it is 67.2 kilo ohms. Okay, so it actually matches what I was guessing. I love it when that actually happens. Okay, so according to our calculator, it pops up and says that the equivalent resistance is 161 thousand eight hundred ohms. Let's see, did I say that right? 161.8 kilo ohms. That makes sense. So if I am to measure across all three of these, basically the very end nodes there, we're expecting this to be about 161.8 kilo ohms. Now there's always a little bit of variation. There's impedances, stray impedances. So it might be off by a little bit, but if it's off by more than about a thousand ohms, I would be very, very surprised. So Let's do that. Let's check from one end to the other. What do we get? 
wait for that to settle. 162.1 kilo ohms. So we're about 300 ohms off of what we expected. In other words, this worked out almost exactly as we thought it would. So now we have seen that with these resistors in parallel, excuse me, in series, we get a voltage drop over each one. So each voltage has a different voltage drop over it, and each node that the resistor is attached to has a different voltage. And we've also seen that being in series, you can basically have a series equivalence resistance that if you just kind of want to ignore the fact that there's three of them and only pay attention to what the two end nodes are and the resistance that you see from there, you can do that extremely easily. Okay, fantastic. I think we are done with the series. Now let's go over to the parallel circuit. Okay, so I'm going to put my handy dandy multimeter off to the side for a moment. And let's look at this. So I did not turn off the power to this. And I still have my analog input one here. Let me switch back to my waveforms here. So I'm expecting one volt on this side and zero volts on this side because our, we have our one volt power supply in here. So as I touch this to here, it should tell me 1.026 volts. So again, exactly what we we're expecting. Now here, there's not much value in measuring the other ones because if I go and I touch the one right next to it, guess what? It's 1.026 again. And I measure the next one and it is 1.0266. Yep, yep, these are the exact same. And again, that's just confirming what we already know, that these are at the same voltage level. So if you measure one, it's the same as measuring all the other ones. And then of course, if I come over to the other side, I should have the exact same result of it being practically zero volts all across. So that's pretty interesting. Now where parallel circuits get more interesting is that even though they have the same voltage across them, they have different amounts of current going through because they're all different resistances. So now in this case, we're going to do the same thing as we did before. We're going to remove all of the, uh, the measurement devices and the power to it. And so with that, let me get this ready to go. I will turn it on and use my third hand here. It makes things very easy because otherwise it's quite a bit of a challenge. And so now I'm going to take each one of these parallel resistors and I'm going to measure them first all together and get the total equivalent resistance. And we're gonna memorize that number and I should have write it down, but we're gonna see if I can actually remember that. And then we're going to measure each one individually before seeing what our calculator says the equivalent resistance is. And if all goes well, which of course it will, it should come out and be almost exactly the same number. So let's start with finding our, at first, our total equivalent resistance. So with my third hand holding the multimeter and my left hand holding the breadboard and this hand doing the measurement itself, I will do my chopstick me measurements to see exactly what I get. Notice how I'm touching multiple leads. It doesn't matter because they are the same node. So we now are getting 2.83 kilo ohms for our total equivalent resistance. So we got to remember that 2.83 kilo ohms for our total resistance. Now we're going to take these out individually and measure them and then see if our equivalent is the same. So 2.83, 2.83 kilo ohms. I can do this. So our first one we're going to measure, what do we get? Six 6.79. So our first one is 6.79 kilo ohms. Let me put that in the computer calculator here really quick, 6.79. I'm gonna see I have some serious short-term memory problems. Make sure that I have all of these at kilo ohms because all of these should be in the kilo ohm range, or at least that is what we will assume. So now we will measure the second resistor. Now, oops, Now for this one, we are getting 11.92 kilo ohms. So we can put that into our calculator as well. And finally, we will do our third resistor. Eight point one eight, where we are getting 8.18 kilo ohms. Now let's see if this works out the way we think it will. 
2,829.5 ohms, which we don't even need to change the calculator on here. We can see that is 2.83, rounded up kilo ohms, 2.83 kilo ohms, which is exactly what we were expecting, which is amazing. I love it when reality matches our calculations. There's just a special feeling about that. One of the beautiful things I love about being an engineer. Okay, we will put this down really quick and thank our third hand. So that's all we had for today. We went over what our series equivalent resistance was and what our parallel equivalent resistance was. And we saw how the reality matched up with our calculations, which is always a wonderful thing. And we also talked about nodes and how those are shared and how that makes them electrically equivalent. One thing before we wrap up, I just want to say, you might have noticed when we did the series equivalent resistance, that the overall equivalent resistance in series is always going to be greater than the largest resistance individually, which makes sense because everything's getting added together. And you get the inverse with the parallel resistance, where the smallest resistor will be bigger than the equivalent resistance in parallel. So if you have all of your resistors in parallel, the overall equivalent resistance will be smaller than the smallest resistor. And those are just two quick things to think about to say, oh, is this what I was expecting or not? Because if you know the value of one of the resistors and it's greater or less, depending on if you're in series or parallel, and it's your calculations and or your rough calculations and your rough expectations aren't what they should be, that means something's wrong. Sometimes you could be touching stuff wrong and you're getting the wrong readings from the multimeter. So it's just very, very important to have these intuitive tricks of wait a second, that's not supposed to be like that. It should be more like this, or at least roughly like this. And so those are just some really quick tricks that will hopefully help you have a better idea of things are working the way they're supposed to be, or there might be a problem in your measurements in the practical way that we're dealing with circuits. So if you found this video helpful, give it a like, subscribe to the channel, and we will catch you in the next one. Take care. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. Did you know that circuitbread.com has more than tutorials? One of the other many things that we have are several excellent open source textbooks that benefit from our search tools, highlighting, super fast page changes, and keyboard friendly navigation. Go check them out.